I'm joined today by this year's John Beniathan lecture, David Kilcullen, to give us some insights into the Islamic world and Australia's response to terrorism. David, I'd like to start with sort of immediate local issues and then sort of pivot to the broader picture here. Um, one of the things we've seen recently is, is a raft of new counter-terrorism measures in Australia, and I'm interested in your perspective on two separate issues here. First, what can we do about the returning foreign fighters perhaps trying to deter or prohibit people from going overseas to fight? Do you think that the government's response has been appropriate and will actually address some of these concerns? Uh, it's a great question. I think um, people should be clear that it is not a crime to travel overseas um, uh, to, to Syria. Um, and even though we're seeing hundreds of people from uh, different ethnic communities in Sydney and Melbourne, young men in particular, but also young women, doing that every month, uh, they're not breaking the law. And so although the, uh, the Customs and Immigration have done a great job in identifying that and figuring out uh, the patterns, and of course, uh, our intelligence and, and police agencies have done the same thing. Uh, th you know, th th there's a there's a question around what should be the appropriate response. I I am generally encouraged by the way that Australia has been approaching this, um, but I will just repeat something that I said last night, which is that I think we have to be extraordinarily cautious about putting in place things that can be used to create significant restrictions to our civil liberties and to our privacy in the name of counterterrorism, And I think that that's a set of decisions that an attorney general or an intelligence um, official or uh, a police officer just really shouldn't be allowed to make because it's, a, it's an issue that all Australians need to be part of that discussion. And people whose job security and future promotion prospects depend on how much money the country spends on counterterrorism really are not the right people to be making that decision. Uh, so I think we need to have an informed national debate. And the question really is, how many terrorist attacks are we willing to accept as the price of preserving our freedom? Or conversely, how much privacy and uh, independence are we willing to give up as the price of, of being safe against terrorism? And that's a very fine policy setting that changes on a day-by-day, -day, sometimes month-by-month -month basis. So if we do, in, in fact, put in place some of the more aggressive regulation that we've been talking about, I think it's very important that we maintain oversight and we maintain sunset clauses, you know, the fact that this is not permanent, it has to be reviewed. And we link it very carefully to trying to reduce the threat so that we can reduce these intrusive security measures. The, well, I live in the States, and one of the issues we have in the States is this kind of security ratchet. So when you put the security level up, no one wants to be the guy that drops it back down again, because then, you know, if an attack happens, they'll be blamed. So I think part of this is also to give our political leaders the freedom to say, we as a society are going to decide what we think is acceptable and we're not going to retroactively hang you out to dry if you make a decision that um, goes bad. It's easy to say that. It's very hard to, to do it in practice. Sure. And I mean, one of the, the key elements, I guess, if you talk about a privacy perspective is the recently passed uh, surveillance powers under the metadata um, restrictions. Now, Australia doesn't have the kind of pretty, uh, protections the US has in their Fourth Amendment from, you know, unreasonable searches and, and that sort of thing. Um, is there a case for these laws in Australia, given that they are open to abuse by not only security forces, but police forces and other government bodies? I think there certainly is the case for them. Um, I think that the the purpose of understanding particular metadata, so the, the things around uh, like time, duration, destination of a phone call and so on, is, uh, is critical to what professionals call traffic analysis, right? So figuring out who's talking to who and what the network looks like, even if you're not looking at uh, content. It is a very useful tool for uh, detecting uh, terrorist activity and other illicit activity ahead of, uh, ahead of an event. So it's important. But again, it's, it's, it's powerful stuff and you need to have appropriate safeguards and oversight. So in the States, with the Fourth Amendment, which as you said, pre um, prevents uh, uh, search and seizure that, that uh, you know, may go against somebody's um, rights to privacy, there is a very strong set of oversight mechanisms. Uh, there's a special court, there's a couple of special committees, uh, and these things are uh, subject to continual review. I still think the setting is a little too far on the side of security and not enough on the side of personal liberty in the States. But again, the States has a very strong tradition of these civil liberties going back to 1776. 
Australia unfortunately doesn't have the same codified set of, um, uh, of regulations. It's more about our convention and what we expect the government to do and not do. And I think that's it's dangerous. I mean, you, you want to formulate <clears throat> that in a, in a fairly clear way. You might trust the current Attorney General, you might trust the current head of ASIS or ASIO not to do uh, the wrong thing. And actually, I happen to think that they are all good people who have the nation's best interests at heart. But if you put in place a long-term set of regulations, what about the next guy and the guy after that and the woman after that? That's, that's when I think you, uh, you, you run into problems. Uh, I want to get a little bit more into some of the differences in ideology that you sort of touched on last night in particular, um, particularly between, you know, the Salafi jihadists and the West, how our classical liberal ideas are basically completely foreign to them. Um, the tradition of Western liberalism, of democracy, separation between church and state took literally hundreds of years to develop in the West. You know, you can draw a line through Magna Carta, the separation of ecclesiastical law and the ecclesiastical courts, the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, even through to things like the Inquisition and the experiences of the French and American revolutions, all had very strong themes of human law, human will, and questioning of this divine revealed law of God. Now. You can contrast that with the Islamic Sharia code, which effectively is interpreted as entrenching religion at the centre of not only sort of religious life, but government, um, civil and criminal law, finances, personal relationships. Absent hundreds of years of struggle like we saw in the West, can we hope to see the development of a sort of broadly based secular Islam um, f that follows democratic norms, the rule of law? Uh, basically, do you see hope for an enlightenment style movement in the Islamic world? Well, I mean, it's a complex question. I, I would say that at different times, different strands of thought and behaviour within uh, the, the world's Muslim communities um, have been any at least as enlightened and uh, and liberal as things that we've seen uh, in the West, but uh, not on a principled basis. Right, they are almost going against some of the uh, tenets of the religion to to act in uh, in that way. Um, and I think that there's also a what you might call a high tradition and a low tradition. There's a sort of urban, sophisticated, fairly secular. Um, generally business and academic oriented culture and then you've got the frontier culture of guys like um, the Mad Mullah in Somalia or uh, the Mahdi in, in Sudan in the 19th century, the guys out in the desert just coming up with crazy uh, and fairly extreme interpretations of the religion. The problem we have now is because of connectivity, uh, a guy like Osama bin Laden is not just a crazy guy in a cave, he's on the internet and he's tweeting and he's got con connectivity and so you've got this kind of ability to influence the mainstream from the periphery and that tends to move the whole debate in a more extreme direction and I think that's a, um, a challenge. I think there is hope for, um, for Muslim liberals, if I want to put it that way, people that care about human dignity and liberty and that want to see a, uh, a religion that is, um, is tolerant and, and follows a lot of the things which are already there in the religion to do with uh, not having compulsion in religion, taking violence out of it, the rights of women, for example, that are all actually rather well protected in Islam by comparison to Christianity or Judaism, actually. Uh, but it's about today and geopolitics and people feeling that they, there's an opportunity now to rewrite 200 years of, of wrongs around colonialism and the fall of the caliphate in 1924. And until that thing works its way through, I think we're unlikely to see that change. Other final point is right now we're seeing a almost a cold war between Sunni and Shia branches of Islam. People feel backed into a corner. They feel like they can't compromise because the alternative to the extremists on our side is the extremists on the other side and at least these extremists are ours, you know. Uh, and I think until that is resolved it's going to be very, very hard for people in the Muslim world to, um, to do anything but choose, you know, one side or the other. Sure. Um, and finally, I guess, looking at it from a more Western perspective, many of the human rights that we believe to be universal, religious freedom, tolerance of homosexuality, equality for women, um, seem to be very foreign concepts in Islamic nation states like Iran. Rightly or wrongly, they're being rejected in those places on the basis of Islam. If we believe that the absence of those rights in the Islamic world is a problem, what can we in the West do to 
convince the Islamic world of the importance of these universal human rights? I, I think, frankly, very little. Um, and I, I think uh, this is best put by, by uh, Majid Nawaz, who's uh, a former radical who's, who's now the head of the Quilliam Foundation in London, who described the Bush administration's effort as trying to spread democracy at the barrel of a gun and pointed out that that hasn't worked very well, mainly because, you know, who are we to get into people's uh, knickers on all these issues? But then he describes the Obama administration's approach as losing the democracy but keeping the gun, so drone strikes and, uh, and counterterrorism raids. And, of course, that's equally bad. I think the greatest opportunities that we've seen for this kind of uh, change in the Muslim world over the last five years were the 2009 uprisings in uh, Iran, where a lot of people rose up calling for secular liberal democracy uh, in the Islamic Republic and were slapped down with massive violence, and then the Arab Spring. And I think that you've got to see what happened after 2001 uh, with the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan and the way that the, um, the environment shifted as related to the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring wasn't some kind of random thing that just happened uh, and was unconnected to everything else we've been trying to do since 9-11. They were part of this, it was all part of the same uh, process. Does that mean that uh, it was stabilising? Probably not, right? I mean, I think the Arab Spring on balance is going to lead to a rise in violence across uh, North Africa and the Middle East for the foreseeable future. But it has at least opened up an alternative line of thinking to Al-Qaeda. So for 20 years, Al-Qaeda said, you know, you've got to take up arms, you've got to fight the West in order to generate change here at home in the Middle East and North Africa. And hundreds of thousands of people with unarmed civil protests, people power, democracy movements, prove that that's not true in the Arab Spring. And I think that that memory is still very important to people, that you can actually overthrow an apostate regime without having to turn to Al-Qaeda. Um, ISIS has filled the gap since the decline of Al-Qaeda. I believe that ISIS will go the same way as Al-Qaeda, that they'll be defeated militarily. But if that's all we're doing, and we're not thinking about the broader question of values and how do we create an environment that's free enough for people to say what they think in their own communities, then uh, we'll be back here again in another decade. And maybe Indonesia is a good example closer to home. That I think it's a very good example. The Indonesians often don't get enough credit for what has been a true and very difficult transition to democracy. The Jamaa Islamiyah, the Al-Qaeda ally in uh, Indonesia, groups like Abu Sayyaf and others, grew up under a, a dictatorship in Indonesia, the Suharto regime, which was rather similar in character to a lot of the oppressive regimes in the Middle East that Ayman al-Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden and, and others have been railing against for 20 years. That's not the Indonesia we have today. Indonesia has really totally transformed itself over the last 15 years or so. And I think that has a huge amount to do with the loss of support for radical uh, jihadist terrorism that we've seen in the country because people now see that there's an opportunity to get what they want through a much freer, more open society. Uh, Indonesia sure still has its problems. I mean, it's a giant country, uh, it's developing, and it has issues like any other country around corruption and, and governance. But it's nowhere near in the same boat as a lot of the places we've just been talking about in the Middle East. Fantastic. David McCullen, thank you very much. For Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me.